Welcome back, Warriors. Tansei Sego, Ani Buju, Kwe Nin Deluizi, Pam Palmeter, and I'm the host of this show, The Warrior Life. This podcast is a show about living the warrior life, a lifestyle that focuses on decolonizing our minds, bodies, and spirits, while at the same time revitalizing our cultures, traditions, practices, laws, and governing structures. But it's also about asserting, living, and defending our sovereignty all over Turtle Island. And we talk to many different warriors on this podcast, warriors and leaders advocating for our people and defending our rights in a wide variety of forums, from boots on the ground to community-based work to engaging at the political and international level. Indigenous peoples work inside and outside of all systems seeking justice for our people. And today, I'm super honored to have on the show Mr. Romeo Saganash. Mr. Saganash has served in many important roles throughout his career, including as a lawyer, a former Grand Chief to the Grand Council of the Crees, a former Director of Quebec Relations, and most recently, he served eight years as NDP MP for, uh, in Quebec uh, in the uh, Abitibi Bay James Nunavik EU riding. During his life, he's made many significant contributions and was recently honored with an honorary doctorate in law from Laval for his important work. He's always been a tireless advocate for justice for Indigenous peoples, and I've always felt very honored to work with him in whatever opportunity I've had and to be able to learn from his experiences and wisdom. Welcome to the show, Mr. Saganash. Well, thank you, Pam. I'm so honored uh, that you invited me here. Um, and miigwech uh, for, for that kind invitation. <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time, because I know a lot of listeners are going to be really interested in, you know, your personal journey and some of the projects that you've worked on. But first, before we get into that, maybe you would like to introduce yourself the way you like to. あ、um, so thank you for, for that invitation. I'm really honored to be here and, and tell a bit of my, my story. Um, I come from uh, uh, Lake Michigan, as a matter of fact. A lot of people say I'm from Oswanapi, but uh, I wasn't born in Oswanapi. I was born on the land, under a tent, uh, late October, uh, sometime in 61 or 62. We're not sure. Uh, because I, I spent the first seven years of my life approximately uh, in a forest with my, my siblings and my parents. Um, then at seven, I was taken away to residential school, like most of my generation. And that, uh, that internment uh, lasted 10 years in my case, in Le Tuc, Quebec. Uh, 14 of us children, uh, out of the 14, 13, were sent to residential schools to in fact, uh, five residential, different residential schools all over Canada, uh, uh, which was done on purpose, as uh, both you and I uh, know. So um, um, I, I, when I came out of residential school, uh, guess what I did? I went back uh, to to the bush for for two years. I lived off the land for an additional two years after I got out of a residential school. Uh, in those two years, uh, in 1985, I, I remember, um, I happened to be walking uh, in, in the community of Oswanapi, uh, and I crossed paths with, uh, with the chief at the time, Abel, uh, Abel Kitchen. And Abel said to me, Romeo, there's a, there's a, there's a huge uh, symposium in Montreal uh, next weekend. Uh, you should come. It's about the 10 years of the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement. You know, there's going to be a lot of participants. You'll learn a lot from what happened uh, during those days uh, of the court cases, negotiations that led to the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement. He said, we'll pay for your, for your way, your travel, your room, your meals, registration, everything. 
so uh, rather than going back to my camp where I was set up for, which is which was about two two hours from from Wasanapi, I went to that symposium in Montreal, ten years of the James Bay North and Quebec Agreement. On the second day of that of that uh, symposium, they had this panel of all the lawyers that represented the different parties uh, uh, to the James Bay Agreement, but also in the court cases. So you had the Canada lead lawyer, the Quebec lead lawyer, the Hydro-Quebec lead lawyer. You had the uh, Inuit of Quebec Association lead lawyer and the uh, Cree, uh, Grand Council Cree lead lawyer, James O'Reilly, speaking on this panel. And uh, as I was listening to James O'Reilly uh, during his presentation, uh, talking about the Cree, talking about Cree history, talking about Cree culture, uh, the Cree territory, the Cree way of life, and so on and so forth. I said to myself, and I really said it that way at that time, I said, fuck, I can do that. <laughs> so, I went, so I went to law school <laughs> because of James O'Reilly, uh, who's still uh, practicing uh, uh, in, in Aboriginal law and constitutional law to this day, well into his 80s. Uh, I admire him very much and he knows this story. Uh, so that's what got me into, into law. <clears throat> and when I came out of law school um, in 1989, um, the, following, the very following year, I got elected as Deputy Grand Chief of the Grand Council of the Cree in 1990. Grand Chief and Deputy Grand Chief, uh, perhaps you notice, but uh, Grand Chief and Deputy Grand Chief of the Cree are elected by the people and not appointed by the chiefs of the Cree people. So it's everybody that gets to participate in the election of the Grand Chief of the Cree and the Deputy Grand Chief of the Cree. Um, so I won my election by 55% at that time. Um, so. For a person that wanted to do that, uh, a master's in political science after my law degree, uh, I got thrown into the ground right away uh, and uh, and became deputy grand chief, the only Cree leader at the time that was able to speak French. Uh, and uh, so if you recall, 1990, uh, the Oka crisis, it was the beginning of our fight against James Bay II. Uh, and we had the constitutional crisis, uh, uh, the Charlottetown Accord and the Meech Lake Accord uh, uh, during that time. So during those three years as Deputy Grand Chief, I, I got it all, <laughs> I had it all. So uh, it, was, it was a great experience uh, for me, uh, especially as a young person back then. Um, and I'm fortunate uh, to say that in my life, I had very inspirational leaders uh, in Ted Moses, uh, in Billy Diamond. In fact, uh, some 40 years ago, 1981, Billy Diamond was my first boss. Late Billy Diamond oh, wow. hired me, hired me back in 1981. So I've been in this business for 40 years, including eight years as a legislator. Uh, so um, I think that baggage of experience from, from those days uh, was important uh, for the work that I've done subsequently. Um, in 1984, uh, I was invited by uh, Ted Moses to uh, Switzerland in Geneva uh, because previously in 1982, the Working Group on Indigenous Populations was created uh, <clears throat> to work on um, to oversee and study the developments and the recognition of indigenous rights across the world, uh, but also to start working on this uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That work started in 1984, and that was <clears throat> the first year I attended with Ted. Ted told me at that time he was a um, former Grand Chief, but also also our ambassador, the Cree, the Cree Nation ambassador to the UN. And he told me, he said, why don't you travel with me? Uh, let's go to the UN. Uh, you don't have to do anything. Just observe how it's done. Maybe you'll like this. 
And from 1984 to the day that the UN General uh, Assembly in 2007 adopted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I was there every summer for the 10 days of the work, working group from 1984 to 2007. So the 23, 23 years, every working group I attended. And there's not too many people uh, in this world that can say, I was there for the 23 years, but I was. So those are the kind of leaders that I looked up to uh, when I was younger. And uh, it brought me to where I am today. That, well, that's incredible. I mean, I've talked to different people, you know, in Canada and the US, Indigenous people who have been part, um, different pieces of, you know, the working group on Indigenous peoples and putting together UNDRIP, but I don't think I've met anyone who's gone to every single uh, session. I mean, that's, you're literally, you were literally there from its birth. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. And it helped me understand a lot of things because you get to work with a lot of people uh, at the UN. It's, it was the uh, the forum, uh, the, the most attended uh, forum every year in Geneva. Uh, uh, numbers that range between 600 people in a room to about 1,200 people in the room. So it's not easy to work through that process because of that. And so many people wanted to speak to specific agenda items. So we had to organize ourselves strategically how to do that. And uh, that's how we came up, for instance, just to give you one example, uh, where we had uh, joint statements of 40, or 40 organizations uh, to speak to Article 3, right, right of self-determination, for instance. So that's how we worked our things out. Things out. And uh, it was quite an experience. And on the day that the uh, UN General Assembly adopted the, the declaration in September 2007, I, I was in New York, but I, I wasn't in the room. Because at that moment, I said to myself, well, you know, I gave it my best. Uh, whatever happens from here on, I think I, I gave my best uh, time, effort, energy, uh, resources uh, to this effort. Uh, whatever happens now, I cannot blame myself. Mm -hmm. So I took a walk. I went for a walk in Central Park and waited for the result. And it was overwhelming in the sense that uh, although uh, you know, we had to do a lot of lobbying to get it adopted because uh, the majority of the UN uh, state members did not attend uh, these sessions in the development and drafting of the declaration. So the two blocks of states, the Asian states and the African states, were not really participants in a 23-year process. So we had to educate them. We had to educate them about the declaration, what it meant if they had any concerns or questions. We, ne we needed to sit down with them, explain what the declaration was all about. And mind you, um, have no doubt that the ones that opposed the declaration in 2007, Canada, US, Australia, and New Zealand, also were, were uh, leading uh, a huge lobbying effort with these countries to get them to vote against. You know, saying things like, oh, this is a, a threat to your territorial integrity uh, and that, that kind of stuff. So uh, it was a, a huge effort uh, during the days between June when the Human Rights Commission accepted the declaration and forwarded it to, to the UN General Assembly for consideration. So that between June and September, uh, Many of us traveled to New York to meet to meet with ambassadors and to convince them to vote for it. So, 144 in favor, um, 11 abstentions, four against. I think was a huge victory as well. That's incredible, and I think most people, unless they've studied or worked in this area, really have no idea mm -hmm. how much work went into this. You often exactly. think about a law or declarations, you know, being written by a policy person or a lawyer somewhere, and then it's submitted. But 
to, to be 23 years in the making with hundreds of indigenous mm -hmm. peoples doing that work. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, and, and, uh, and I got to tell you, there are times during that process where uh, I would just drop my arms and, and tell my colleagues, I'm going home. This is bullshit. I'm going home. Because there, there are times where we thought we had advanced on certain issues and, and the, the difficult ones, like uh, the provisions on self-determination, provisions on lands, territories, and resources. Got to tell you, those, those were the difficult uh, um, provisions that we had to deal with. And when, when at times we thought that we had advanced, the very next day after the, the state caucus or a certain group of caucuses, uh, 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 they would come back the next day and say, oh, we changed. I'm persuaded in any case, that the right of self-determination of peoples applies to indigenous peoples as confirmed by the Human Rights Committee as early as 1999. In fact, uh, we made submissions to the Human Rights Committee who oversees the two uh, UN uh, human rights uh, covenants. Uh, and they, they confirmed in 1999 that uh, yes, the right to self-determination that we refer to in Article 1 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the other Covenant on Civil, Economic and Cultural Rights does apply to Indigenous peoples, 1999. I still remember that day in New York. I mean, it's, an, it's incredible that we even had to have a declaration for Indigenous peoples, that it wasn't just assumed that every human right, every right that exists on the planet also applies to Indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that, that is the reason why it's unfortunate when, when we talk about the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, uh, we always talk about the, the land, territory, uh, and resource <clears throat> provisions, uh, articles, uh, Article 3, which is the right of self-determination. But no one ever mentions Article 1 yeah. of, of the UN Declaration, yeah. <laughs> where, whereby Article 1 confirms that all international human rights instruments apply to Indigenous peoples as well, which... <laughs> Basically confirms that, yeah, we're humans too, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is important, you know, yeah, because absolutely. it also, you know, people distinguish between there's human rights over here and indigenous rights over here, but indigenous rights are human rights and indigenous peoples have human rights and they're all the same. But without those very yeah. blatant, yeah. like Article <clears throat> 1 importing all of the human rights and making these statements, it's it's like people wouldn't actually get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, you must uh, care I'm, very. I mean, you must care so deeply. I know you went for a walk <laughs> to wait for what the results were going to be, and obviously <laughs> it was it was passed. But you know, now you've you've moved forward in Canada like you've never given up the UNDRIP project in a sense because you know you had introduced that legislation. To, to have Canada implemented here, to make it law, part of our foundational mm -hmm. domestic law. Yeah, um, I think uh, that was the, the logic uh, uh, step afterwards to have it uh, adopted and implemented in, in Canada mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in keeping with the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's uh, calls to action 43 and 44. Uh, um, my my two private members' bills uh, refer to that. Um, that was the intent there to make sure that the laws uh, in Canada are consistent with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and not the opposite, uh, which is sort of a debate today. We can mm -hmm. talk about that as well. But uh, uh, so that, that was the intent there. Um, and uh, uh, it's unfortunate. Well, the first, the first time that I tried was under a uh, Harper government. Mm -hmm. uh, we and we know how violently they oppose uh, uh, the UN Declaration, the Conservatives. Um, so uh, I knew I didn't have a chance. I, I knew the faith of my first private members' bill before I even introduced it. 
to parliament under a Harper government. Uh, so that, that I knew, but I did say after it was defeated on a vote on second reading uh, that if re-elected in 2015, I would come back with a similar uh, legislation, which I did. Uh, although uh, I was hoping that the government uh, of today, Trudeau, after his election in 2015 and after that solemn promise yeah. he made to the chiefs in assembly in, in December 2015 that he would uh, adopt legislation on UNDRIP uh, never happened. In fact, that's, what, that's one of the, the sayings on Parliament Hill. The most difficult challenge uh, in Ottawa is to keep a liberal promise. <laughs> uh, so, that's, uh, so it never happened. So I introduced Bill C-262 in that context. And it took me a good two years and a half to convince the liberal government to support Bill C-262 in spite of that promise. Uh, so it was mainly because of the, the enormous public pressure that they've been getting over the, la over the two years that led to the vote, uh, two and a half that led to the support. Uh, I traveled the country. Uh, I spent some seven, eight weeks on the road from the Maritimes all the way to BC, uh, holding um, uh, uh, public uh, uh, forums, uh, uh, everywhere I went uh, with Indigenous communities and non-Indigenous communities uh, throughout the country, just to educate people about what this UN declaration is all about and why Canadians sh should support it. And that's what we did. Uh, I traveled throughout the country with my beautiful partner um, and uh, we did all these town hall meetings uh, throughout the country for eight weeks. And if you can spend eight weeks in a small space like a car with a person, it, it means that you get along with, <laughs> with that person. <laughs> so that, that's, it's, it's unfortunate that Bill C-262 did not make it through the Senate, uh, given the, the full of, full of bus strain of five conservative senators, un, unelected, unaccountable. So they managed to kill my bill uh, by filibustering it and ran out of time. So um, the bill died in late late June, just a week after the passing of my mom. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And, and the month that's supposed to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day, you know, like, it on makes, that, the, it makes those that days day. sound hollow. Yeah, wasn't it the very day? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, on that very day, exactly. So yeah. here, here we are again with another bill trying to implement UNDRIP and it looks like in all likelihood we won't have Quebec support, we won't have conservative support. I mean, what, what, well, I mean, what are um, your thoughts on that? Well, I think I think uh, it was expected by the conservatives to who are staunchly opposed to this to this uh, declaration, and that hasn't changed. Um, in fact, they refuse to be convinced of the opposite um, uh, because even during the process, the Senate with Bill C two six two, they refused to meet with me. Uh, you know, to answer their questions or respond to their concerns, they refused. So they refused to be, to be convinced on this. Um, nevertheless, I think, I think uh, um, it is important to, to be mindful of the fact that uh, uh, the Bloc Québécois will most likely vote against it only because, and I tweeted this, only because uh, they opposed anything called systemic racism. And there's a preamble or paragraph that refers to systemic racism against Indigenous peoples. Uh, so they probably most likely refuse to support the bill because of that, <laughs> which is stupid and unfortunate. But, uh, but uh, um, my concern is not that, because even with the Liberal and the NDP, this could pass. Um, I also commented on Twitter well, I, I think they, they're pulling, the Liberals are pulling 
uh, another Kelowna here in the sense that they've introduced this. They've had it. If they were going to copy Bill C-262 uh, almost word for word, they should have just introduced it at, at the first occasion, but they waited all this time. Um, so we're, it's late in the day. Uh, I don't think the bill will make it through all of the stages that uh, Bill normally goes through um, uh, before an election. Uh, I think we're headed uh, for an election in late spring. Um, and so I don't think the bill will, will make it through because of that. And it's all the local government's fault in my view. Um, but uh, um, in any case, uh, I think uh, the debates that we're having about it right now um, are worthwhile. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, there are certain people that are, that are opposed to Bill C-15, uh, which is, uh, absolutely uh, their right to do so. Uh, others that support it. Uh, um, I think that <clears throat> the, the preamble of Bill C-15 uh, compared to 262 is more uh, elaborate. Uh, some clumsy uh, drafting, some preamble paragraphs in my view. I need to clarify certain things in the um, operative uh, articles of uh, there's a misunderstanding or what I call in legal terms a misread of, uh, of Bill C-15. Uh, the bill does not say that, uh, uh, the, that the declaration will be bound by our constitution, but it's the opposite. When, when the bill says that uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has application in Canadian law, it means that the courts can refer to the declaration to interpret domestic uh, constitutional um, rights and human rights for that matter. So I think it's important to make that distinction. Uh, this rule, and this rule came about as early as 1987 in the Public Service Employee uh, Relations Act of Alberta, 1987. It's a reference case. And uh, in that case, a judge, former Chief Justice Dixon says this about declarations, conventions, and international treaties and instruments, says, uh, these are relevant and persuasive sources to interpret domestic law. So that's the rule, and this this uh, this has been quoted over and over again by by the Supreme Court uh, over the years. So that's the rule here, and uh, to say that uh, the declaration is going to be under the Constitution uh, is is uh, is a misinterpretation of the law in in my sense. The other aspect uh, that uh, we seem to forget in that discussion is the fact that. Uh, I remember the day, <clears throat> I think it was in 2017 or 18, on, uh, on, on uh, St. Valentine's Day, uh, Justin Trudeau made a speech in the House to talk about a rights recognition framework that they wanted to implement. So he spoke for 22, uh, 24 minutes uh, on that proposal. Um, <clears throat> which was uh, uh, one of the biggest promoters of that was uh, jo jo Jody Wilson-Raybould for a long time. So the rights recognition framework, in my view, um, is not the correct name for what he was talking about. Uh, so I responded, uh, I took the 24 minutes to respond to his statement in the house that day, because if he does 24 minutes, I'm allowed to do 24 and I, I took that opportunity. Our rights have been recognized. So why are we talking about rights recognition? Uh, we should be talking about respect of rights of indigenous peoples. And there are different frameworks already that exist. We have the constitution, we have the treaties, we have indigenous law, we have case law, we have international law. These are all frameworks that are, that are distinct, legal frameworks that are distinct but uh, uh, but mutually reinforcing. And this is how we, we need to know one of those legal, not one of those legal frameworks supersedes the other. They're all interrelated and mutually reinforcing. And that's, that's how I view at least uh, all of these issues. 
and that's why I think that the uh, opposition to Bill C-15 is just is just a mistake and uh, um, a misunderstanding of the terms of that proposed leg legislation. Basically, um, when Indigenous peoples were working on something to be included in the Constitution, it ultimately turned out to be Section 35. There was hope that it wouldn't just protect Aboriginal treaty rights or practices, but that it would also protect, you know, core issues like self-governance and self-determination. And we worked really hard mm -hmm. for that. That didn't, you know, pan out in the constitutional talks, but, you know, Fast forward, and now you have UNDRIP, and I think many people were hoping that UNDRIP could do some of the unfinished work that Section 35 didn't do, that all of these rights and um, the recognition of our rights and powers and authorities would now finally be recognized in domestic law, so we don't have to have a constitutional mm -hmm. debate about whether yeah. or not we have the right to be self-determining, that UNDRIP would just settle that once and for all, even if it isn't within Section 35, and that those things could coexist together. Do you think that that's possible? Well, it is, and uh, mind you, the, uh, in the preamble of uh, the declaration, the rights set out in the UN declaration are said to be inherent. Right. And I believe that the, cons the constitutional recognition of Aboriginal rights, we are talking about inherent rights as well. I think everybody agrees today that uh, in that uh, non-defined clause in our constitution, self-government is included. I think there's, there's uh, uh, the legal uh, community recognized, recognizes that today. I think what, what, what needs to be also highlighted in that discussion is that there, there's a reason why, um, and people don't necessarily realize this, there's a reason why the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is in part one of the Constitution, and section 35 is in part two of the Constitution. Uh, we tried to make sure, make sure at that time that uh, those rights under section 35 uh, could not be subjected to the not notwithstanding clause uh, that that is usable against the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So that's an important, really important element in that constitutional discussion. The other the other thing, and and I I always quote this in in my in my talks, um, is that in the 2014 Chilcotin case, the Supreme Court says something interesting. Uh, uh, in that case, uh, Supreme Court says that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms that we find in part run and Aboriginal treaty rights that we find in part two of our constitution are sister provisions that serve to limit the powers of governments, both federal and provincial. Hooray. Like, you know, we're advancing that concept of reconciliation that the Supreme Court also talked about in 2004 in the Haida Nation case, whereby it said essentially, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, the objective of reconciliation is to reconcile the pre-existing sovereignty of indigenous peoples with the assumed sovereignty of the crown. So we're getting somewhere here. So that's why I always make a distinction between all of these different legal frameworks that we have at our disposal in our toolbox to fight for uh, what we think uh, should our right of self-determination look like. And, and I'm, I'm always mindful of those different parts um, uh, that, are, that are useful to, to our causes. Well, yeah, and it's, and it's important to have these discussions and explain them and think about what, what the law is today, what it could be, how all of these things work together, and, um, and, and to remember that it, that it was, in fact, Indigenous peoples that worked on UNDRIP, mm -hmm. and that it was Indigenous peoples that said, let's include all human rights in Article 1, and it's Indigenous peoples who have said, you know, let's not just lobby and work for this and educate people but get it implemented domestically and you know whether it's 
the Truth and Reconciliation Report or the National mm -hmm. Inquiry into Murder to Missing Indigenous Women, all of the testimony they heard consistently were calls by Indigenous peoples to implement it domestically. Now, I don't think any of us blindly have faith that the government will interpret it the way we want to, but that's Absolutely. like the next stage. Yeah. The first yeah. stage is having it as part yeah. of our domestic law. Absolutely. I mean, one part is the essential and fundamental part is the legal part, in my view. Uh, the rest is political. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I haven't, in my 40 years of experience, I haven't seen one government, provincial or federal, act in good faith when it comes to Indigenous rights in this country. Never. I can say that with complete confidence. I have never seen them act in good faith. And that will continue, unfortunately. And that's the legacy uh, um, that unfortunately will leave to the future generation, future generations. Uh, but, uh, uh, and I always give this example, however clear uh, our rights are stated in declarations, in the constitution, in, in case law, or in our treaties, they will always try to find a way to get around them. And I'll give you an example. The James Bay North and Quebec Agreement in Section 28 of the agreement is the uh, Social and Community Development chapter of the agreement, Section 28. It's very clearly set out in Chapter 28 that, that both governments, Quebec and Canada, um, on, on, a, on equal basis, 50-50, on equal basis, will construct community centers in each Cree village. It's as written as clearly as I'm stating it right now. And for thir almost 30 years, both governments neglected to implement that provision. You know why? Because they claimed for over almost 30 years that there was no definition in the James Bay North and Quebec Agreement for a community center. It's called bad faith. And uh, I remember during negotiations with governments in those days, uh, before I became member of parliament, that uh, uh, I used to tell them, you know what, I'm from Moswanapi. And 100 kilometers from Moswanapi, there's a non-Indigenous community called Le Belle sur Quivion. And Le Belle sur Quivion has a community center. In fact, it's called the community center of the Belso Quivion. It has an arena, a library, a movie theater, bowling alleys, a swimming pool, a community center, even the offices of the mayor are, are in that building. And I used to tell them, we don't need that much. <laughs> Let's give us a fucking hall <laughs> where we can meet. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's almost to absurdity the ways yeah. in which yeah. they will resist even just the basics mm -hmm. yeah i mean really if you in the grand scheme of things how much would community centers cost in the grand scheme of things Absolutely. but instead to fight about it yeah yeah and they make billions of billions of revenues from our lands territories and res resources every year and we get peanuts out of, of those revenues. Uh, so I think that that needs to change. Mm -hmm. uh, we managed to do that a little bit with the James Bay North and Quebec Agreement in 2002. And by the way, the Cree have signed over, since 1975, the first uh, modern treaty. Uh, we've signed over 100 agreements uh, with governments, both, uh, both levels, and with corporations, in a territory. And that's free prior and informed consent in action. So when you respect that right of free prior informed consent, um, both parties win. And that's what we've been, we've been doing over the years. Uh, Section 25.2 of the James Bay Agreement says that the $195 million that the Cree got as compensation in 1975 for that huge territory uh, was the final payment there was nothing that will come from that anymore. And, uh, but we managed to change that in, in uh, 2002. Now we get at least, uh, at least 70 million a year, 
in revenue sharing from the development of the territory. Uh, and since, and that's since 19, 19, uh, 2002. So, you know, the things evolve uh, incrementally, sure. But uh, I think that's, that's the kind of things that we need to work on. And I believe that Bill C-15 is just another incremental step in uh, moving forward in that sense. Well, can you talk a little bit about why the James Bay Agreement, even to this day, stands as a unique agreement amongst all others, whether it's a comprehensive land claim or a self-government agreement or some kind of modern treaty, there is no other agreement that's ever been signed that is like that James Bay Agreement. I think the main reason is that, um, well, first of all, the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement is the first treaty in this country that was also signed by a province. Quebec being uh, that supposedly distinct uh, society um, insisted uh, on preserving their uh, areas of jurisdiction, health and education mainly. So that, that's, that's the reason, that's the main reason why uh, our health uh, funding and our um, education funding comes from Quebec in the case of the Cree in Northern Quebec. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, I believe the other, the other thing, uh, the, the other main aspect of all of this, why there hasn't been any other treaty or agreement uh, that closely resembles the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement because I think the governments have learned their lesson. They, they learned their lesson. They, they learned uh, that over the years that this agreement uh, is uh, that they've given too much to the Cree under this agreement. Um, you know, not, not all laws of general application, for instance, apply in Northern Quebec. That's why we have a distinct uh, environmental protection uh, regime in Northern Quebec uh, because of the James Bay Agreement. That's why we have a distinct forestry regime in Northern Quebec because of the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement. Uh, so that's, uh, that's why we have all these uh, provincial legislations that enabled um, many chapters of the James Bay in Northern Quebec Agreement in Quebec. Uh, so I think the governments learned their lesson uh, from, from that and that they will never uh, replicate uh, this sort of agreement in the future, unfortunately, because it works. Well, the, you, you yeah. would think that that would be the logic that they would use to say, oh, yeah. look what works in terms yeah. of having a hundred agreements with industry and government and here's how consent works and, and here's how there's give and take on both sides and here's how yeah. governance can work. Why don't we do that elsewhere? Like, yeah. do you think you would replicate that? But instead, if you look at their policy, they've whittled it down to something not much more than Indian Act governance. And you think, why? You've got this massive difference. Even, mm -hmm. I would say, although it's not at the same level, the Council for Yukon First Nations, their early self-government umbrella agreement is mm -hmm. markedly different from yep. the newer ones um, in mm -hmm. BC, for example. And yep. so it seems like they're constantly changing what it is that they're willing to put on the table. Uh, I don't know if you... Uh, if you were born uh, uh, at that time, but uh, uh, I remember how uh, other First Nations across the country um, really went at the Cree for signing the James Bay North and Quebec Agreement. We were, we were called uh, sellouts. We were called uh, um, uh, traitors by all other First Nations in this country. But guess what? Uh, this this worked out to be to be okay for us uh, um, with all the different parts uh, of implementation of the James Bay Agreement. The Cree get about uh, $600 million a year 
to finance their policing services, uh, their school boards, their health board, the health board, um, justice system, uh, their self-government, uh, local self-government structures, and so on and so forth. So it's it's huge if you calculate that over over 45 years. Uh, so it's I think it's it's important to realize that. But uh, uh, nevertheless, once once you sign these type of agreements, the fight is not over. The fight mm -hmm. just begins. And that's what I always tell people, uh, signing an agreement or a treaty is the beginning of the fight to get those rights respected and implemented. Uh, 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 so that's, that's, the, that's the biggest challenge uh, that has been there for us over, over the years. We, like we were in court <clears throat> almost every year for the first 25 years against Quebec and Canada and Hydro-Quebec and forestry companies and mining mining companies because uh, once these, they got what they wanted with the James Bay project in 1975, they deliberately uh, forgot about the rest and their obligations uh, towards us. So uh, so we always have to be vigilant with this, this kind of stuff and, and uh, that's why they say that uh, uh, your 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 freedom depends on your vigilance all the time yeah well it's something that you have to live every day you never reach a state of oh look i it's good we're yeah. all good we've we're got done. all these rights we can sit back i mean yeah. look at nunavut even nunavut if you think about you know how that was created what has been one of their biggest beefs implementation in respect yeah. of the actual agreement and that's a public yeah. government yeah, that's right. So yeah, that's right. I think it, it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, we know from our historic treaties, it's all about implementation. It's a fight. Yeah. We know about our yeah. human rights. It's a fight. Yeah. And I think that, you know, we've got to take these things in measure. And ultimately, I think around these things, if, if this is what the James Bay Creed wanted and they went in with full prior and informed consent, then that's what sovereignty is in action. They mm -hmm. said, here's the deal that works for us. Here's our pros and cons, our give and take. And it's not for Mi'kmaq people to judge Cree people or any other group because each one is going to do their own thing. Oh, we absolutely. might have views about whether it's good or bad, but yeah. uh, to this date, there hasn't been another agreement like That's the right. James Bay Agreement. Yeah, and, and uh, it's, it's the Cree... Uh, right of self-determination expressed through this partnership and peaceful co coexistence that we thought we had achieved by signing the, the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement. Uh, obviously, governments did not uh, view, it, view it that way, but that, that was the view expressed by the Cree. Our negotiators at the time uh, said uh, there are two fundamental elements that we need um, protected in this agreement our uh, cultural uh, rights to continue to hunt fish and trap if we so choose. And there's about 20% of the Cree population that still live off the land with a support program. Uh, our, our institutions have uh, adopted a, a cultural um, ag uh, agenda and calendar for all of their activities, meaning that there's a goose break in the spring for everyone, including the kids in our school. So our kids start school earlier than the rest of the province and finish later than the rest of the province because of those traditional cultural breaks that we have in their calendar. So I think that's important and, and that's why it's important for me uh, to make sure that that wasn't there. Um, and it also, and the agreement also provided for the possibility of others to choose uh, different, different economy uh, and different uh, and work uh, like I did. Um, although I still love to go hunting and fishing uh, when I have an opportunity to do so. Uh, but at least that right is protected constitutionally uh, by the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement. And I'm very grateful for that. Well, it's, it's incredible. And I, um, one of the things that, you know, I've, I've recognized about you is that, you know, you have this history of the worst of Canada from residential schools 
the best of your culture, living in the bush, being grounded in your like Cree politics, having worked at the Grand Council and worked on all these things, but also having worked in the Canadian political system. Like you've been mm. in and out and in some of the most, working on some of the most incredible projects. Like, yeah. do you have any insights you could share with some of our listeners about some of the differences between working on the inside and the outside? Yes, uh, I think for, for a long time, uh, working uh, from uh, outside of the walls of the National Assembly in Quebec, outside of the walls of the Parliament of Canada, uh, I finally decided uh, to try it from within and see what I can do <laughs> from within. And uh, it was interesting. I resisted the idea. Every provincial election, every federal election, I'm asked, uh, to run for uh, this party or that party, except the conservatives never asked me. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why, but they never asked me. Uh, but, uh, but I, I've been asked for a long time. Uh, in fact, in 2005, uh, Jack Layton approached me after speaking to one of their, their uh, conferences, uh, and. Uh, asked me if I would consider eventually <clears throat> to run for the NDP federally. And at that time, in 2005, I said, no, my kids are still growing up and um, I need to take more time with them and so on. So uh, I didn't decide until 2011. Uh, when I called him on that February morning in 2011, uh, I said, I think Jack, uh, I think I'm ready. And he said, what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> I said, well, I have a couple of meetings, uh, um, which I can work around. He said, postpone them. Come and see me in Toronto, uh, my house on Huron Street in Toronto. We'll discuss it. So we sat down for three hours. And uh, um, I had spent, after my law school, I went to Quebec City to do my articling. Uh, I was supposed to stay there for one year. Uh, finally ended up staying there for, for 20 years. I for, just forgot to leave. And, and uh, so, so I wanted to run in Quebec City and Jack uh, thought otherwise. And something in, he said something important to me at that moment. He said, you know what, Romeo, um, all of the global challenges that we have today, whether it's the climate crisis, uh, water crisis, um, resource development, um, indigenous peoples and the future of indigenous peoples, uh, the North, all of these challenges that we have globally are also in that writing of Abitimi Bay James Nunavikiyu which you pronounce right, by the way. Oh. It, took the, it took the Speaker of the House three, three years to pronounce it right. <laughs> it took you one minute. Uh, so, uh, so he said, all of those challenges are also found uh, in your homeland. So why don't you go back home, buddy, he said. So that's why I ran in Northern Quebec instead. And although I resisted the idea of running for office federally or provincially, um, I'm glad I did it. Uh, th those eight years were difficult, challenging at times, but very worthwhile from an experienced perspective. You know, I walked into that place uh, trying to change things. And I know, I know that you cannot change colonial places uh, just by snapping your finger. Uh, I know that. And the first thing I did uh, at the very first day, at the first session of the 41st Parliament after my election in 2011, is I went up to the clerk and I asked her, may I ask my questions in Cree, do my speeches in Cree, and provide my statements in the house in Cree? And her response was very clear uh, and direct. She did not even hesitate. She said, Romeo, 
as a jurist, you should know that the official languages of this place is French and English. A, re a response, of course, that I, I did not accept. And I worked on that. It took seven years uh, to finally change that. So that's, it's a small decolonization step, but it is nevertheless a step. So any Indigenous member of parliament today uh, can stand up in that house and speak his or her language without having to fight for it. I'm proud of that. And I did the same with, uh, with C232, uh, 262. of course, uh, uh, I fought hard for that. Mm -hmm. um, note that the legacy of C262 is that more people in Canada are ed educated about the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That's what I leave behind. And uh, I'm hoping that we can move, move forward mm -hmm. from there. But it's, it's, it's uh, being inside those institutions is also an incredible platform to advocate for the things that, 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 uh, that you fight for. It's, an, it's a platform and it gives you access to media, gives you access to a whole bunch of things that an ordinary citizen, whether indigenous or not, does not have. So you have to use that privilege uh, wisely with very clear objectives in your mind, what you intend to achieve in that kind of place, which is very racist, sometimes open, sometimes very subtle. Uh, and, and racism is so normalized, especially in those institutions, that people, uh, MPs sometimes don't, don't even realize that they're racist in their comments. One of the first, one of the first uh, encounters I had with uh, uh, a member of parliament from the Conservative Party was in the gym, because I hang out in the gym. Uh, you need that to keep, keep, your, keep uh, your sanity. Um, so I was working out and this Conservative MP, uh, whom I, I won't name, but uh, comes up to me, he says, Romeo, when you guys go hunting, do you use guns? <laughs> Was his oh. question. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I didn't even bother uh, to respond to that question. <laughs> I just looked up uh, and continued with my with my training. But uh, you know, mm -hmm. and when you when you get your rights, uh, when you see that your rights are up for debate uh, continuously in a place like the Parliament of Canada. It's, it's troublesome and uh, it's concerning uh, for me. And uh, so I had to stand up uh, many times in the house to remind people that we're not their nations. We're not their First Nations because whenever politicians in that place get up and talk about First Nations, they talk about our First Nations. Yeah. And uh, you know, I have to stand up many times in that place to remind them that I don't belong to anybody. Uh, so th those are the kind of things. It's a difficult and challenging space uh, for Indigenous people. But uh, if you know what you want uh, to achieve in that place, I think uh, it's uh, overwhelming and, and worthwhile at the end of the day. So uh, I did not seek re-election in 2019 because that was the plan. Uh, I told Jack, okay, I'll do this, but not more than, than two mandates. So even before I got elected in 2011, I had uh, told uh, uh, the people at the NDP that I would do two mandates and that's it. And that's what I did. Well, I am I know lots of us are so thankful that you were there because you did call attention, you did speak in the house and that gets on mainstream media and you spoke out on issues. And for me personally, I always found, you know, parliament and the Senate very intimidating. And oftentimes, as you know, I would be asked to testify before committees mm -hmm. and just knowing that you were sitting there and that there would be one friendly, kind person on that committee. <laughs> 
uh, that that was like a huge relief so just just by virtue of you being there mm -hmm. made it just a little bit more accessible a little less intimidating for people like us who aren't in parliament to come in and make our presentations and even if everybody else tore it apart we knew at least one person would be mm -hmm. there to ask yeah. a supportive question or to give you more time to speak and that that means a whole lot when you're when you're an advocate, as you know. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I got criticism for, for running uh, 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 to, to be a member of parliament uh, many times so over time, even before I decided. But I always remind people of Article 5 of the UN Declaration, whereby it says that uh, any Indigenous person can participate in, in economic, social, and political um, forms of uh, a state without losing their status as an Indigenous person. Uh, so um, throughout my eight years, I truly believe that I remained who I am, a Cree, and proud of those roots. And, uh, and I understand that uh, uh, what you're saying about that place being intimidating, uh, but uh, I think, I think uh, once you enter in the belly of that beast, uh, it's it's pretty easy to get around uh, if you know what you want to do in that place. And uh, that's that was my intention. I just I did not go in there not knowing what I wanted to do in that place. Uh, uh, I knew exactly what I I wanted to do. Uh, I knew exactly that I could use what I have as a person uh, to my advantage, speaking French, speaking Cree, speaking English, um, uh, that's, uh, that helped a lot. Uh, so it's, uh, I think it was important uh, uh, for me to be able to be who I am, even, even in that int intimidating uh, place, which is the Parliament of Canada. Um, if I had to do it again, I, I would do it again, perhaps even better. Uh, but uh, I have a partner that does it even better today, so uh, so I don't have to go back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have such a you have such a good way about it and, and explaining it. But I'm sure over the years that you know the flack you get on the inside, and then you know the public. It doesn't matter what you do; you're always going to be critiqued for something. Like so, you get it from both sides. It must have worn after a while, but you know, I, I couldn't let this interview go by without asking you about one of my favorite highlights of your time <laughs> in Parliament. And I think you know what I mean. It was when you stood up in Parliament and criticized Prime Minister Trudeau for his lack of priority around respecting Indigenous rights. And I won't read the whole thing. But your final statement was, why doesn't the prime minister just say the truth and tell indigenous peoples that he doesn't give a fuck about their rights? Mm -hmm. Can you share with listeners, what was the context? <clears throat> what was the issue that spurred you to speak so strongly? I haven't, I haven't observed and watched the liberal governments since they got elected in 2015. Uh, there was there was a troubling tendency of saying one thing and doing the opposite, right? And even the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal noted that in its third compliance order, I believe, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal says, the ministers say one thing in public, the departments continue to do the opposite. Uh, so it's not just me, it's also the uh, Human Rights Tribunal that's been saying that. So. I was getting frustrated and exasperated by their attitudes and their actions uh, and their decisions about a lot of issues in this country uh, relating to Indigenous peoples. So I was totally fed up uh, at that point. And, you know, after a couple of days of questioning during question period, um, our, my team ran out of questions to ask, to ask them. Because they, they, they respond the same thing all the time. Uh, well, they're non-responses all the time. Uh, but um, so that morning, um, um, one of my staff texted me saying, what, what are you gonna ask today? You have a question today. 
So I wrote that text that you just read. This is what I'm going to say. And she said, good luck with that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think our uh, communications team or the leadership team of the NDP will accept it. I said, I don't care. I'll do it because there's no other word. I've, I've tried to find another word because I knew that word was not parliamentary. I tried to find another word that morning. I couldn't. It was the only word. So I said it. And uh, that's how it came about. And I think, I think history since then has proven me right, mm -hmm. uh, without a doubt. And this is going to continue, I'm pretty sure. Like, uh, just look at some of the issues that we have on the ground today. Uh, uh, water pour, boil advisories, uh, uh, housing, uh, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal is still a matter of grave concern for me. Uh, St. Anne's Residential School survive, Survivors Court case and the destruction of evidence, uh, those are all still there. And uh, so one of the changes or amendments that I wanted to bring, and I'll bring it up uh, with Bill C-15, is that um, Bill C-262 talked about um, ensuring that the laws of Canada are consistent with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous mm -hmm. Peoples. What I proposed at the end of that, those hearings in committee was that maybe we should add uh, to laws, policies and operational practices. It's the operational practices that continue uh, um, to this day that gets us where we are with these different issues. And um, my vis-a-vis -vis with the Liberal government uh, on committee at that time told me it's a good idea, but I, I don't think I would be able to go up the chain of command to the PMO to achieve that in time. So we left it at that and we left Bill C-262 as is uh, because of that because there's a lot of things that had to go up and down all the time. So um, so those are some of my regrets uh, about uh, the process that I had to go through. But uh, overall, uh, it's been quite an experience. Uh, I'm glad I did it. Uh, I have that in my CV now, member of parliament for more than eight years. Uh, and. Um, I guess that brings me to, to a point where I know a thing or two about uh, parliamentary process in this country. Uh, I'm not allowed to lobby the government uh, for five years under the uh, Lobbying Act, uh, which prevents me from running for national chief, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have no intention there, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But that, that would be the effect uh, of the lobbying act on, on me. Uh, I'm not allowed to lobby the federal government for, for five years. So I'm trying to do work uh, elsewhere. I do a lot of writing these days. Uh, um, uh, so I'm happy with that. Well, that's good. And, and we're thankful for everything that you've done because we all know change doesn't happen always when we want it. I mean, our ancestors fought generations ago for what we have today. So the seeds that you planted, the work that you did will be picked up by someone yeah. else and in another okay. generation, and it might be brought to fruition in the exact same way or in a different way, but it's the fact that you were there yeah. fighting yeah. the fight, representing yeah. us, having that voice and supporting us behind the scenes. Cause that's the stuff people won't see yeah. all the yeah. ways in which you help lift up other voices and support mm -hmm. people. You know, you don't get credit for all the work, but. Um, yeah. Well, that, that's a good point. And maybe uh, I want to address that because uh, um, I think picking up from where I left uh, is a good image because um, Billy Diamond did that for me. Billy Diamond uh, negotiated and signed the James Bay North and Quebec Agreement. I picked that up from there and negotiated uh, a new relationship agreement in 2002 with the government of Quebec that modernized the James Bay North and Quebec Agreement in 2002. Uh, I'm leaving behind 
a lot of stuff, including the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And it's up to the younger generation or the upcoming generation to pick that up and take us wherever they think uh, is a good place for us. Um, that's, that's, that's my only legacy, I think, uh, to bring us to where we are. Uh, and it's up to the next generation to, uh, uh, to pick it up from there and, mm -hmm. and take us further forward. Incredible lessons learned too. I mean, you still have so much to share with people. So I hope mm -hmm. your writing will eventually be public and you can come back on the podcast and sure. share yeah. what you're working on because it's, you know, through all of these lived experiences, what worked, what didn't work, what strategy should we use, what shouldn't we use, that's gold, you know, yeah. and that only comes from being in the lived experience. And um, I guess before we say goodbye, if, if you had a, a vision for Canada, where should we be headed? What will be, what would make the core difference in Canada's relation with Indigenous peoples, do you think, in addition to recognizing UNDRIP and implementing it? it, it I mean, are there other things that you think are really fundamental? I think the problem has been, always been, and I'm speaking from 40 years of experience, is the unwillingness unwill of governments to, um, to start from a good faith position with respect mm -hmm. to indigenous peoples. You know, the honor of the crown is always at stake when you're dealing with ind indigenous peoples in this country. And that's because of the bad faith that, I, that is always uh, there with governments, whether provincial or federal. And let's recall the fact that the BC government uh, adopted the UN declaration legislation and, and Couple, couple of days later, uh, kicked out the Wet'suwet'en off their territory, uh, and and I, I dislike when politicians say uh, this is going to take time. Mm -hmm. Be patient. That's what John John Horgan said at that moment. You won't. This, this is not the first time you're going to be disappointed. These matters take take time. Be patient. Well, we've been patient for a long time, I think. And uh, so it's not a matter of patience. None of these issues are complicated. None of these issues are complicated. It wasn't complicated to find uh, $12 billion to buy a pipeline, right? Uh, so it shouldn't be complicated to fix all the water boil uh, advisories that we have already or the housing crisis in our communities, uh, which is clearly exposed now during COVID, you know, all of the inequities and inequalities that indigenous peoples face in this country are now clearly exposed by this, by this pandemic. Um, and so I think the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement, just to go back to that, uh, is a pretty complex and complicated document. Mm -hmm. Almost four, uh, 500 pages uh, disagreement. And yet, it took one year to negotiate. Wow. The 14 pages of the agreement in principle in 1974 took one year. And the 500 pages of the final treaty took one year. So if there's political will by governments to do the right thing, or if they are forced by courts to do the right thing, we can do it pretty rapidly. But that's never the intent of governments, unfortunately. And that's what I had to fight over 40 years. And unfortunately, that's what our children will continue to fight for the next 40 years. Well, you've laid out a good path and I'm so honored that you spent so much time here today and um, I'm really thankful um, that you shared your experiences and your knowledge and your insight um, about all of this inside and outside of government, James Bay Agreement, UNDRIP, all of it, because it's, these are really, really important issues that we're all struggling with. So thank you for taking the time um, to share your knowledges and your experience and insights. Um, Walalan, thank you. Merci. Ikose. Miigwech. Miigwech, Pam. I was honored to be there.
Well, thank you so much. And thank you to all the podcast listeners for tuning in to the Warrior Life podcast. I hope you share this important conversation with Mr. Romeo Saganash amongst your friends, families, communities, and beyond. I'll make sure to post a link to the both UNDRIP, but also the UNDRIP uh, uh, legislation so that you can read it and think about it and and reflect on what's been said today thank you so much for taking the time to learn more and do more till next time keep living a warrior life Walaliag.